So we've come up to the lake this morning to do a little experiment with our watches. A lot of the time we get athletes telling us <laughs> that they're disappointed or happy with swimming time splits per hundred etc in open water and as a coach it can be difficult to uh, help athletes to understand how inaccurate GPS can be especially in open water so Mark and I are going to swim side by side and we're going to both have our watches on we're going to take our our times at the same points and we're going to compare distance and swim splits and see what the disparity is. We did four laps, two Caroline and I swam together side by side. Then this third lap, I wore both watches on my wrist. And then the fourth lap, we had both watches on the back of my head. So it'd be interesting to see the difference between those, especially the last one when they're like this. Because the accelerometers in the watches can get confused when you're moving around back and forth. Uh, but we, we've found those pretty accurate, so yeah, we'll go back and look on the on train Excel and have a look, see how those compare with each other. Just a reminder, we're back in from the swim this morning. I was wearing a, a Suntour 9, it's probably about five years old, it's a really good watch. It's never let me down. And Caroline's got a... It's a Garmin Full Runner, which is mainly a running watch um, because I don't use it for swim and bike. I've got a bike computer, so... But with our platform, we can you change can... that file to a swimming file. Yeah. We do that. So I recorded it as a run, or recorded four laps as runs, but then have changed it to swims on the platform. And we wanted to see how inaccurate each watch was in open water and then what the comparison was as well between the two. Um, yeah. I mean, sometimes I have swimmers who like swim two, meet two minutes per hundred in the pool and they go out and they do three kilometers in 40 minutes in open water. <laughs> I yeah. think, well, that's not right. <laughs> well, so what's, what's important here is also we did four laps on this, on this loop, right? And it was a, a triangle area, very difficult to get it wrong. So we, we swam in a straight line. The first two laps, I was wearing this, Caroline was wearing that one, and we swam shoulder to shoulder, and we stopped, stopped and started the watch at exactly the same time, okay? Then for the third lap, I wore- Both watches. Both watches on each wrist. Uh, Caroline started and stopped the watches. And then on the last lap, I put two watches behind the back of my goggles, and again, Caroline started and stopped them. So four laps in total. And we should say that there were boys, so- Yeah, yellow the boys. Lap was Boy, boy, two boys and back. So it was direct line. They weren't very far apart. It was easy to see them. There was no way we could really go wrong on it. <laughs> so we've had a brief look at these and I am shocked. I knew they were going to be inaccurate. That's why I don't bother wearing a watch in open water. But it is quite shocking how terrible this is. So this is the trace from lap one um, on the Garmin. And you can see that it was really struggling to pick up uh, the GPS signal. And it recorded a kilometre <laughs> for an eight minute swim, which is an average pace of 48 seconds per 100, which I'm quite pleased with. And so but I was swimming really strongly that day. So what Caroline did, she started and stopped and created separate files each time, which on reflection, I should have done the same because as you can see here with my trace of the four laps, they're all they're over overlaid. The, yeah, they're all over the show. But it's quite interesting to see that overlay as well. Yeah. So... Okay, so that was lap one. That was when we swam side by side. Yeah. And what's interesting is that the Sunto recorded 584 metres and the Garmin recorded just over a kilometre. Yeah. Um, so you were swimming 124 pace, which is probably more or less roughly what... It was the first lap, yeah. It was the first lap. We're quite yeah. slow, maybe yeah. a bit slower than that. Um, but yeah, the time obviously was the same for both. Um, and mine was recording 48 seconds per 100. <laughs> and then we repeated it. And what's interesting is that 
because my Garmin had said it had picked up GPS signal on the first lap. But what's interesting is the second lap was identical. We swam side by side and we had each had our watches on, but it was slightly more accurate the second time around. If you look at the trace. Yeah, your trace is. On the second lap, it's not great, but it's better than it was. It's still saying I swam 883 meters. <laughs> and I swam um, second lap. So second lap, 522. 522 meters. Yeah. So yours second lap was like 132 pace and mine was 50, 55 second pace. Terrible. Um, so a big difference between those two as well. Yeah, but what's interesting as well is that we swam those laps identical in terms of RPE and well, pace. Shoulder to shoulder, yeah. And your first lap, so even with the same watch, where it, where we think it was slightly more accurate, you had, you still had a massive difference in pace, 124 for the first lap, 132 for the second lap, 584 metres for the first lap, 520 for the second lap. Yeah. So, you know. Okay, <laughs> let's go on to the third lap. So Mark was wearing both the watches on the third lap. Um, the trace is slightly different. Um, Still not brilliantly accurate. You can see a couple of patches where it was struggling, struggling to pick up a signal. Um, 642 meters this time, so it's going down. And mine was pretty close. Um, and then yours was 620. 620 meters, yeah. So they were pretty similar in terms of that, and the average pace was quite similar too because they obviously picked up a similar sort of distance. So I had one on left hand and one on the right hand, and my watch had me doing 118s. And this one said 115s. I mean, I can't really explain that. I think it's a fluke because yeah, I don't think it had anything to do with the fact that you had both watches on. No. Really, because we swam side by side before. Because of the four laps, I thought the fourth would be the most accurate. Well, my trace certainly looks the most accurate on the last lap. It doesn't jinx around too much. It struggled to pick it up to start with. And then it was... You know, looks it looks fairly accurate, um, and if you compare it to the one above, um, you can see like it's more accurate than the one above. Uh, so that was six hundred forty-two, and this one was five hundred and thirty-two. All right, and mine was. Yours was five hundred and thirty-two on the last. Sorry, four hundred and ninety-three on the last one. Yeah. And 135s. Now, I know for a fact, based on RPE as well, and I'm pretty good at pacing myself, I wasn't swimming 135 pace, not a chance. No, but also your last lap was your fastest lap. Yeah. I I wasn't swimming with you, so you weren't having to no, wait. No, that's, that's my point. Yeah. That's my whole um, point, is that I wasn't swimming 135s. I was swimming on the four laps. That was me swimming at my fastest. Yeah. So, so the Garmin got it wrong there. And my Garmin said 129 pace for that last lap. Which is warm-up pace for me. Yeah. All right, let's go so, through. In terms of accuracies, I mean, I think it's known that, well, people know that Garmin's are not accurate, but people would maybe think maybe 5% or something like that. Well, people don't know. People think they are accurate. <laughs> yeah. That's the whole point. People yes. think they're accurate yeah. and they, they show data and say, oh, well, I did a, a PB for this, that, and the other. They are not accurate. They're way off being accurate. And we understand this because we've created our own training platform. So we understand the, and we see it on a day-to-day -day basis, is the difference between uh, elevation, hours. distance, mm -hmm. uh, and in water, you might as well t f toss a coin, yeah. you know. Um, so let's, so we brought down the numbers and the, the percentage of differences and deviations, yeah, and we did, we did a mean average, didn't we, from the four? Yeah, I mean, let's just do a summary. It's quite yeah. difficult to understand, but the Sunto, the average distance was 554 metres, and the Garmin, the average distance was 771. So even the averages, you know, there's a good 200 meter difference there. From the two watches? On, yeah, yeah. on a lap. Let's talk um, about the differences between so, each lap, the, the different uh, variation. Well, I mean, I just think what's interesting is the Sunto, um, even where it was being worn on the back of the head, where it was picking up the best GPS signal was still 12% different to the average lap distance. Yeah. We don't have a control. Like the control would be whether we, if we'd gone out with a tape measure and actually measured yeah, this yeah. lap and said, this is the distance. So our control, what we've done is taken an average of all the four laps in terms of distance and said, okay, that is the average. Um, and when we do that, 
the worst case is 23% out and the best case is 12% out. Mm -hmm. And for the Garmin Forerunner, um, the best case is 26% out and the worst case is about 70% out. I mean, it told me I did a kilometre mm. in eight minutes at mm. the beginning. So mine, mine was a bit closer, but it was still... Definitely, I think the, the Sinto seemed to perform better. Um, but, you know... 23% was the... Uh... Yeah. But then it performed better, but then you can see on the last lap that it was wildly wrong. Yeah. So, because yeah. Of, because we know that that isn't the distance you... or the time that you were swimming. So, so our conclusion, basically, <laughs> our conclusion no is take whatever information you get regarding distance and then the pace obviously is um, calculated from that distance. Take it with a pinch of salt. It's not verbatim. The only real way of understanding uh, your paces is in a pool, yeah. 50 meter pool, 25 meter pool or something that you know has been measured accurately. And it's the same for the bike and the run. Yeah. Um, Swimming's more difficult for sure, for the GPS and the ex accelerometers in the watch get confused a little bit. That's why I thought at the back of the head would work much better. Well, and I also think that's the point on this one. Um, the GPS is slightly weaker mm. and every time you put your hand into the water, it pretty much loses signal. Lose signal. Whereas I think yours is probably keeping yeah. the signal a bit more a bit, consistently. Yeah. Um, and what's also probably worth mentioning is if, you, if you've got integrated goggles that work from your watch and you're using it for open water to train. It's the same. It's based on the same information, yeah, which so, is... So, you know, Mark was swimming, I don't know, 120 pace on the last lap, yeah, say. Yeah, easy, yeah. Maybe 115, and yeah. it's telling him he's swimming 135s. And that's just going to piss you off. Yeah, if you're is. swimming and you're yeah, thinking, yeah. well, I, I feel really fast. And I'm, and I'm on the rivet, like, yeah, I'm at threshold. I mean, so, essentially, there is no point in wearing a watch in open water what we normally do, time our swim, so we want to swim for an hour. You can you can trace, for example, off a map, you can look at a map and you can trace how far is this lake from end to end. And then you can say, well, it's roughly a kilometre, I'm going to swim roughly a kilometre out and roughly a kilometre back. And that's good enough for open water. But you don't want to be in open water thinking about what is my pace. No. That's for pool swimming. Yes. But what I would say as well is if, if you do want to do open water interval sessions, thresholds, steady state, race pace simulations. What I would do and what we do do is we, we put um, boys out on the water and we do specific sessions based on that. And it's still an estimation, but... Well, it's done off RPE. Yeah, off RPE. Yeah. It's not done off And we do pace. it off, we do it off, let's say we do uh, 50 strokes hard. 50 strokes easy. 50 strokes easy. Yeah. That kind of stuff. Um, or, you know, for example, if Mark and I had been going out to do a specific session on this on this loop, we would have swum it once at steady pace and gone, yeah. oh, that's about eight minutes. Okay, that's roughly 500 meters, whatever. Yeah, we'd work that off from our average swim pace yeah. from the pool. And then we'd say, right, okay, if we want to do a 3K swim, let's do this lap six times and we'll do one easy, one one hard, etc. So you can build a session very easily in open water. It doesn't need to be done off data. Yeah. And yeah, that's about it, isn't it, really? I'm, I'm shocked. Yeah, yeah. Are well, you I'm, shocked? Yeah. I'm not. I'm not shocked because only because some of the times that I've had, and you know that they're way off, like one twelves for four k. We yeah, and we've we've swum before together in open water with our watches on, and, and that's different. when I stopped using it because yeah. they were so different. Yeah. Anyway, we hope you've learned some of it. Yeah. We, we certainly have. Um, yeah. Still enjoy your open water swimming. It's certainly um, something that I would encourage. Yeah. People should do more open water swimming. That's not the point. The point is that it's it shouldn't be based on. Don't data. be don't be a slave to this. Yeah. Don't be a slave. Yeah.